If you've clicked on this video, chances are you're a lover of true crime stories from the past. In this compilation of episodes, that's exactly what you'll be getting. We begin with a story from Georgian era England, the twisted and twisting tale of Catherine Hayes. Born near Birmingham in 1690, Catherine's life would be one filled with troubles. Her parents were poor and newspapers at the time described her mother as being adulterous and wicked, though we're not sure if that was merely to spice up the story. It's said that when she was 15, however, a group of soldiers visited her village with Catherine taking a shine to one in particular and perhaps seeing a way to escape. She ran off with the officers to Gombersley in Worcestershire. It wasn't much of an escape though, as she had to resort to prostitution to eke out a living. The officers eventually moved on and with it went Catherine's primary clientele. She made her way to Warwickshire, looking to find work as a domestic and at 16, she was taken on as a servant working for Farmer Hayes. Mr. Hayes had two sons with the eldest John, soon catching Catherine's eye. The two soon fell for each other with them having two children out of wedlock, with at least one of these being left in a basket outside a church in the nearby village of Holtheath. Catherine insisted that they marry, much to the chagrin of John's father, who had many misgivings about the relationship. Catherine threatened suicide if the wedding didn't go ahead, however, and he soon backed down. The night of the wedding, it's said that Catherine had her newlywed husband press ganged by military officers. His father managed to get him freed, but she convinced John to enlist. Reports at the time implied that this was because she had a taste for men in uniform and this would allow her access to many of them. He signed up and it said the pair traveled with the officers to Spain, where she indulged in all manner of debauchery and wickedness. The pair would return to the UK after John's father managed to secure his son's release for the princely sum of 60 pounds. With Catherine tired of rural life, she convinced John that they should start anew in London. Here, John set up as a coal merchant and pawnbroker, later becoming a money lender, using funds left to him when his father passed away. Things on the outside seemed to be going well, but behind the scenes, things were deteriorating rapidly. Catherine was angry at the allowance she was being given by John, demanding more to carry on her party girl lifestyle. He refused and responded by reducing the amount he gave her instead. In 1725, she had convinced John that they should take in a lodger. He obliged and they took in a young tailor named Thomas Billings. The pair soon began having an affair, though this wasn't enough to satisfy Catherine's urges. To this end, a second lodger was also taken in, one Thomas Wood, who, handily for things to come, was a butcher by trade. With their marriage beyond repair and with divorce not really being an option in 18th century England, Catherine, along with Billings, sought to convince Wood that John Hayes must die. Catherine told him stories of how Hayes had killed a man in the country before they moved to London, how he would threaten her daily, and perhaps most sinister of all, how he had killed several of their children. The truth of these accusations is lost to time. Catherine also offered Wood the £1,500 she'd be worth once the deed was done. Being a religious man, Wood had misgivings, but she told him it would be no worse than killing a cat or a dog, and that John had damned Christ and said there was no God. Days passed, and Wood still harbored his misgivings, and even felt tempted to reveal what he had been asked to do but did not want to bring Catherine into disrepute or lose the roof over his head. Then on the 1st of March, 1726, Thomas Wood returned to the house after visiting friends and was met at the door by Catherine. She offered him a dram of whiskey. He turned it down saying he would prefer beer. So she gave him sixpence and Wood made his way to the pub. Upon finishing his second pint, Thomas Billings entered the bar looking for Wood. He ushered him back to the house where they had gotten their hands on some strong wine and beer. Inside, Billings, Wood, Catherine and John began drinking heavily. Had Catherine had a change of heart? All seemed well, 
but all was not as it seemed. Catherine and Billings were staying just sober enough. John Hayes soon had a few drinks too many and went to sleep it off. Billings followed behind and with Hayes laid inebriated in the bed, struck him in the head with a coal axe and after his legs gave a few kicks and spasms, the deed was done. Wood and Catherine rushed into the room with Catherine stating that they now had to remove his head lest they be betrayed. She brought in the knives to do the job and held a candle while the two Toms set about decapitating the corpse. The noises coming from the house alerted a neighbor who sought to check in on what was going on. Catherine brought her inside and explained that they had friends over and were just merrymaking. While the neighbor was sat there, the two Toms came downstairs with something wrapped in a bundle of cloths. Catherine told her it was merely some old clothes. Billings and Wood threw the head into the River Thames that night and the next day they cut up the body, placed it in a trunk and disposed of it in a pond. That same day, however, the head they had dumped in the Thames the night before was discovered and in an effort to identify the victim, it was stuck on a pole and displayed in the churchyard of St. Margaret's Westminster. After several days, it had the desired effect and was identified as being that of John Hayes. On March 24th, the other body parts were found and the trio was soon arrested. Wood confessed and Billings, who had been caught in bed with Catherine when the police arrived, soon admitted playing a part, but Catherine denied all knowledge of the murder. During the trial, however, she eventually reneged on her early denial, stating that she repented nothing other than involving the two men in the deed. It was also revealed to the jury that Thomas Billings, the young man she had been having an affair with, was none other than the son she had left on a church doorstep some 19 years earlier. It's reported in some of the newspapers at the time that this was the first Billings had known how closely they were related, that he had been having an affair with his own mother and that he may have killed his own father. Though some reports suggest he was the product of an affair with a local tanner. All three were eventually sentenced to death. Billings and Wood were charged with murder and so would be hanged, but Catherine had been charged with the crime of petty treason, so her death would be much worse. Petty treason was a crime wherein a subordinate would kill or otherwise violate someone above them, either in rank or social standing. Being a married woman, Catherine was seen as being lesser to her husband. The crime was seen as not just murder, but an attack on society. So, whereas Wood and Billings would be hanged, Catherine's punishment was to be burned at the stake. Wood died in prison the day before his execution from jail fever. Catherine would not be so lucky. The day of her execution was beset with troubles as a viewing platform erected for those wanting to watch collapsed with some 150 people on it, several of them being killed or injured. Before her own death, Catherine would be present to watch her son, Thomas Billings, be hanged. Then she was tied to a stake with a chain around her waist and a bundle of twigs at her feet set ablaze. Perhaps seeing how barbaric the act was, there was also a rope placed around the necks of those sentenced to die this way. So executioners could pull it tight as the fire was started, choking the person to death before the fire took hold. This day, however, the flames were fierce and it's said that they either burned the hands of the executioner or burned through the rope, leading Catherine to scream in agony and shout, oh Jesus, what shall I do? As she was enveloped by the blaze, she tried to beat down the flames with her hand and feet to no avail. The executioner is then said to have thrown a block of wood at her head, which cracked her skull and dashed out her brains. An hour later, she was ash. Catherine paid the ultimate price for her crimes and would be one of the last people to be burned at the stake in England. The dubious honor of being the last person to be burned at the stake going to another Catherine, Catherine Murphy, a counterfeiter in 1789, with the punishment being abolished in the following year, 1790. Next up, 
we have a case from the Victorian era that has only recently been fully laid to rest. Born Kate Lawler in 1849 in the small town of Killeen in County Wexford, Ireland, she was the daughter of poor yet respectable parents. However, she was known amongst the local community for being a troublemaker. This reputation was largely garnered because during her youth, she would regularly steal things, often getting caught red-handed. When she was a teenager, Webster managed to successfully steal a large amount of money, which she used to buy a ticket to Liverpool. There, she tried her hand at picking pockets in a bid to make ends meet, but she was terrible at it. At the age of 18, she was caught and sentenced to four years hard labor. Upon her release from prison, Webster decided to travel to London, where she found work as a charwoman, a term used to refer to ladies employed to clean houses and offices. However, her income from this was too meager and she began picking pockets as a way to support herself. This led her to serve a string of short prison sentences despite using aliases like Webb, Gibbs and Lawler to evade the authorities. She also started working nights as a prostitute, which resulted in her giving birth to a son in 1874. She named him John and would alternate between naming three different men as the father. Having a young son failed to reform her though. Webster continued with her criminal activities and was often forced to leave her son behind with a fellow charwoman named Sarah Crease whenever she was incarcerated. In January 1879, Webster found employment as a housekeeper for a 52-year-old woman named Julia Martha Thomas a retired school teacher whose husband had left her with a considerable fortune. She lived in Richmond, a town located on the outskirts of London in a semi-detached property called Two Mayfield Cottages. Thomas lived here alone, although she was known to occasionally take in servants to help with the upkeep, one of those being one Kate Webster. Thomas had high hopes for Webster, but she would soon be very disappointed, not least by her lack of cleaning skills, but her propensity to spend what could be considered far too much time just down the road at the local pub, The Hole in the Wall. Thomas's constant scolding and nagging annoyed Webster no end. Later, Webster claimed that Thomas would, quote, point out places where she said I did not clean, showing evidence of a nasty spirit towards me. As weeks passed, this relationship deteriorated, so much so that Thomas asked Webster to leave on February 28, a mere month after she had first employed her. Webster, however, begged to stay until March the 2nd, to which Thomas hesitantly agreed. Unfortunately for her though, it was a decision that would ultimately prove to be fatal. Thomas was a devout Presbyterian and worshiped regularly here at this church, which of course you can see has now been converted into flats. Back in the day, however, when Julia had missed several Sunday services, her friends began to worry. Meanwhile, her former housekeeper, Kate Webster, returned to Hammersmith, the district where she had previously lived. There, she met up with an old friend named Henry Porter and his son, Robert. She told them that after marrying a man named Thomas, she had come into some wealth after a relative died and left the contents of two Mayfield cottages to her. She also explained that she was in town to find a broker for the furniture that she had no need for. In the middle of dinner, Webster left to visit a friend and returned without the heavy bag that she had initially been carrying. Afterward, Robert Porter helped her carry a large box from two Mayfield cottages to a nearby bridge where she said another friend would meet up with her. As he walked away, he claimed to have heard a faint splash. However, Webster, who later caught up with them, explained that the meeting went well and that her friend had picked up the box. A few days later, Webster met up with a broker named John Church, whom Henry Porter had introduced her to. 
he offered her £68 for the unwanted furniture, which she gratefully accepted. On March the 5th, a coal porter came across the heavy box that Webster had thrown over the bridge. When he opened it, he was horrified to discover the mangled remains of a woman's torso and legs. One foot was missing, although this was later found in Twickenham, a suburb located nearby. Since the woman couldn't be identified without her head, she was buried at a public cemetery, with the case becoming known as the Barnes Mystery, named after the Barnes Railway Bridge where her remains were found. The authorities tried their best to figure out what happened to her, but with neither name nor leads, the case soon went cold. By then, Julia Thomas's neighbors hadn't seen her for over two weeks. When removal men arrived at her home on March the 18th, they became suspicious, especially after workers told them that they had been hired by a woman named Mrs. Thomas, who was selling her furniture. When she was called, however, the Mrs. Thomas turned out to be none other than Kate Webster, whom the neighbors knew was the housekeeper that Julia Thomas had recently fired. They attempted to question her about her former employer's whereabouts, but she was unable to come up with a plausible story. Fearing that her cover was blown and knowing this crime was by far her most heinous, Webster panicked and traveled back to her hometown in County Wexford, Ireland, in a bid to escape the authorities. Back in London, investigators encountered a horrifying scene inside two Mayfield cottages. Not only were the walls splattered with blood, but a kitchen grate also showed evidence of charred bones, while behind the laundry boiler was what seemed to be a fatty substance. Fortunately, Webster was arrested in Ireland and taken back to Richmond. Her trial, which began on July the 2nd, 1879, became an instant sensation, with hordes of people inside and outside the courtroom. For modern historians, the interest in Webster's case wasn't merely due to the fact that she had committed a gruesome murder. Rather, many were drawn to it because she was a woman and because she had dared to attack somebody who was of a higher social class than she was. Webster initially claimed that she had nothing to do with the crime. To defend herself, she accused Henry Porter and the broker of conspiring with each other to kill Julia Thomas in order to gain access to the luxurious contents of her home. When both men presented solid alibis, she instead blamed a former lover of hers named Mr. Strong, whom she claimed had fathered her son and had driven her to a life of crime. This argument may have been compelling, but it wasn't enough to save her from punishment. In the end, after a week-long trial, she was convicted of killing Julia Thomas. In a last-ditch effort to avoid the death penalty, Webster claimed she was pregnant. After some delay, it was decided that a jury of matrons should decide whether this was true. The jury of matrons was made up of women who were attending the court at the time. These were then asked to deliberate on whether Webster was quick with child or not. They decided she was not, and Webster was sentenced to death by hanging. The night before she was set to be executed, Webster was visited by a priest who administered her final rites. To him, she finally confessed that, quote, I alone committed the murder of Mrs. Thomas, According to her, she had come home drunk from the local pub and was met by Thomas, who began scolding her. Infuriated, Webster threw her from the top of the stairs before strangling her to death. She then proceeded to chop up the old woman's limbs before boiling them in the laundry tub to hide what she had done. Webster's account of the murder led to rumors spreading that she had attempted to sell Thomas's fat to one of the local pubs or offered it to neighbors as dripping. This was the fat normally collected from roast meat and primarily used in British cooking or eaten cold spread on bread. Some even claimed that she had fed some to two young boys. However, neither of these allegations were substantiated. 
what authorities did know is that Thomas's bones were burned in the hearth while the rest of her remains were thrown into the river. One of her feet was also dumped in a nearby suburb after Webster found that she was unable to close the box where she had stuffed her elderly employer's body. Despite the police's best efforts though, Thomas's head wasn't found. For the murder of Julia Thomas, Kate Webster was hanged on July 29, 1879. A broadsheet that reported on the event read, quote, the executioner, having drawn the cap over her face, retired from the scaffold. The unhappy criminal was launched into eternity. Webster's story didn't end that day, though. In 2009, the world-renowned English naturalist and broadcaster Sir David Attenborough purchased a building next to his house, which turned out to be none other than Webster's favourite pub, The Hole in the Wall. After much excavation, the workmen found a skull, which of course they immediately handed over to the police. After subjecting it to a thorough examination, investigators stated that the skull had, quote, fracture marks consistent with the fall down the stairs and low collagen levels consistent with it being boiled. With these findings, the coroner ruled that the skull belonged to Julia Martha Thomas, the woman who had been murdered over 100 years prior. The Victorians were responsible for some of mankind's brightest achievements, but also some of its darkest crimes. Those of Amelia Dyer were particularly sinister. Amelia Elizabeth Dyer Nee Hobley was the youngest of five siblings born in the small village of Pyle Marsh near Bristol. For most part, her young life was bright. She was the daughter of a master shoemaker and was lucky enough to learn to read and write, developing a love of poetry and literature. The brightness didn't last long. Her mother suffered from severe mental illness brought on by typhus and being the youngest sibling, Di was obliged to care for her ailing mother and she descended into madness. During this period, her older sister, Sarah Ann, died and her mother went on to have another daughter a few years later who they also named Sarah Ann, sadly also passing away a few months after birth. Her mother eventually succumbed to her illness and Dyer left the family home and moved to Bristol where she eventually met and married George Thomas. He was 59 years old, Amelia 24. On their marriage certificate, they both lied about their ages to lessen the gap, her adding six years, he surprisingly subtracting 11. After the marriage, Dyer began training to become a nurse, and during this time, she met midwife Ellen Dane, who herself was a very sinister figure. She informed Dyer of an easier way to make money by using her home as lodgings for young women who had conceived illegitimately. Life in Victorian Britain was hard for single mothers who had children out of wedlock. In 1834, the Poor Law Amendment Act removed any obligation for the fathers to pay for their unplanned offspring, leaving mothers in a difficult financial bind. This, along with the general stigmatizing of single parenthood and illegitimacy, gave rise to the practice of baby farming, wherein individuals, nefarious or otherwise, would act as adoption or fostering agents in return for regular payments or an upfront fee from the mothers. Many businesses were set up to look after the pregnant women and upon birth, the baby would be left behind to be cared for as a nurse child. The whole situation was ripe for financial exploitation and that is exactly what happened. If the child came from well-off parents who simply wanted to keep the birth secret, then agents would charge a one-off fee of up to £80. The vast majority of those seeking their services were impoverished, however, and they would command a fee of £5. A good yearly wage would have been around the £20 to £30 mark, so that seemingly meagre amount accounted for a large chunk of someone's yearly income. If the child managed to be fostered or find a permanent home, then everyone would be happy. But these were dark times and it wasn't unheard of for some agents to starve or in some other way 
hastened the death of the infants in their care. This was Victorian Britain and getting your hands on hard drugs was as easy as taking a trip to your local chemist. A syrup known colloquially as mother's friend was a favorite at the time. This opium-based medicine was used to calm screaming babies. A lot of the times these screams were for food and so this was used to ease them into starving to death. For those that couldn't get their hands on that, alcohol was a widely used alternative. Coroners at the time would often record the deaths as debility from birth or lack of mother's milk. Others would simply put starvation as this wasn't an uncommon occurrence even in a caring Victorian home. Parents who wanted to check up on the children they left behind would often come up against a brick wall. Most, however, were too ashamed to pursue any thoughts of wrongdoing they may have had. This is the world that had been revealed to Amelia Dyer, and with the birth of her own daughter and the passing of her elderly husband, she found herself in need of an income. Despite all the years caring for her mother and those spent nursing the ill, Dyer turned her hand to baby farming with sickening ease. She advertised to nurse and adult babies in return for a substantial one-off payment along with adequate clothing for the child. She assured her clients that she offered a warm and loving home. In 1872, Amelia married William Dyer and they had two children of their own. This didn't soften Amelia's dark heart. In fact, she grew tired of waiting for the poor children left in her care to starve instead moving to kill them outright through strangulation and other means. This was long before forensic tools were available to the police and so Dyer had little trouble avoiding their attention. That was until one doctor grew suspicious of the amount of child deaths he had been called to certify at her home. She soon found herself in front of a judge not charged with murder or manslaughter, however, but the lesser charge of neglect. She was found guilty and sentenced to a mere six months hard labor. Despite the leniency of the sentence, Dyer found it difficult going. Upon release, she tried to resume a nursing career, this being interspersed with periods inside mental hospitals for alleged mental instability and suicidal thoughts. It must be noted that these times inside coincided quite well with times that she needed to disappear from the prying eyes of the authorities. Dyer had spent time as an asylum nurse and knew how to act to ensure a speedy trip inside and a comfortable existence therein. The baby farming had started again, but instead of learning her lessons, she simply grew more deceptive. She no longer called upon doctors to issue death certificates and instead, began to dispose of the bodies. Once more, the authorities tried to pursue her, not least after one woman returned to check upon her child and sensing Dyer's suspicious ways, asked to see a birthmark on the child's hip. It wasn't there and Dyer soon moved town. This was another tactic she would employ. Once the heat got too much in one town, she fled to another using a multitude of aliases. She would eventually end up here in Caversham in Reading. And already separated from her husband, she would find herself a new unsuspecting associate, one Jane Granny Smith. Now, Jane would always be referred to as mother, especially in front of new and unsuspecting parents. This, of course, was to engender a feeling of mother-daughter loving relationship, especially when they were about to hand over their child and indeed money. By now, lying and murder were second nature for Dyer. Advertising her services in Bristol newspapers under the name of Mrs. Harding, she would travel to collect her latest victim. Feigning the image of a caring would-be adopter, then instead of making her way back to Reading, she would travel to her daughter's house in Wilsdon, London. Once there, she would use edging tape used in dressmaking, wind it around her victim's neck, pulling tightly until they were no more. She later said that she used to enjoy watching them with the tape around their necks. She would then place the bodies in bags and or suitcases and weighed down with bricks, come to a secluded spot here by the river in Caversham and place them in the water. 
and March the 30th, 1896, one of those packages was found by a bargeman. It contained the body of Helena Fry, one of Dyer's most recent victims. The police were alerted to the find and with the help of some microscopic investigation, were able to find along with a train ticket to Bristol Temple Meads train station, an address and the name Mrs. Thomas, another of Dyer's aliases. Using these details along with the subsequent investigation, they were able to track down Dyer, raiding her home on April the 3rd. Officers say they were struck by the stench of decomposition in the home, though no bodies were found. They did, however, find telegrams and letters from mothers who had left their children with Dyer, along with the receipts for adverts placed and reels of edging tape. The police found that in the past few months alone, 20 children had been put in the care of Amelia Dyer. After her arrest on the 4th of April, they dredged the Thames and a further six victims were discovered. Dyer only admitted to one of the murders and, in a letter written from her cell at Reading Jail, she says that she acted alone, absolving her daughter and son-in-law who had been arrested along with her. They were later released without charge. Also in the letter, Dyer says that she hoped to be forgiven for her acts in heaven. At her trial, the only defence she offered was insanity. The prosecution argued successfully that her exhibitions of mental instability had been ploys designed to throw off suspicions. It took the jury just over four minutes to find her guilty, sentencing her to death. And on June the 10th, 1896, she perhaps felt a little of what she had inflicted on others as a noose was placed around her neck and tightened before the trapdoor was released and she was hanged. Despite being charged for six murders, it's thought that her victims numbered many more. Some say as many as 300 or more. The Dyer case caused a national outcry which saw changes to adoption laws and helped to establish the fledgling NSPCC charity. It would take time for the practice of baby farming to be fully stamped out, however, and two years after the death of Amelia Dyer at a train station in Plymouth, a sum of money and a young life were handed over to a woman who used a false name and made promises she didn't intend to keep. Upon leaving the mother and boarding a train, the woman pocketed the money and placed the child in a box and left it on an empty train line, alone to die. Rail workers found the parcel. Inside, a three-week-old, cold, wet, but alive. The mysterious woman that had left her to die was thought to be none other than Polly Dyer, the daughter of Amelia. Our friends across the pond weren't without their fair share of murderers during this period either. Arguably, the most famous was the case of H. H. Holmes. But just how much of his story is true? Herman W. Mudgett was born on May 16, 1861 to Levi Mudgett and Theodate Mudgett in Gilmanton, New Hampshire. Both Herman's parents were descended from the first English immigrants in the area. By all accounts, young Herman's life was relatively normal and unremarkable. There are no reports of Levi and Theodate being anything other than upright, respectable citizens who regularly attended church. None of their neighbours or extended family members had anything bad to say about them, not even about Herman himself. On the contrary, he was remembered as being a quiet and studious young man with refined taste and no interest in participating in the rough games of his peers. There were those who had some doubts as to whether Herman was as perfect as everyone thought. A cobbler who worked with him at one point said that the boy indeed was a hard worker, but there was something about Herman that he did not like. Some of it had to do with Herman's love for money. One time, the young man stole 43 cents from the cobbler's vest pocket, and another time, he tried to get paid twice for the same work. His fondness for money did not go unnoticed by other locals either, and it would not disappear as he grew older. One neighbour, 
also noted that Herman was a bit of a loner, saying he always seemed to be by himself. I know that instead of playing with the other boys, he would wander off alone on long walks. He never was much of a favourite with other boys and they did not understand him. He seemed to be very secretive. By the age of 16, Herman had graduated from Phillips Exeter Academy and was now working odd jobs alongside teaching in Gilmanton and later in nearby Alton. Around this time, he met a woman named Clara Lovering. There are differing details about how the two became a couple, but it's thought the pair were married on July the 4th, 1878. Clara's family were not overly pleased at the speed at which the pair's relationship had progressed. But despite this, they set Herman up with a job working at Clara's uncle's grocery store in East Concord. He was still working there when the couple's son, Robert Lovering Mudgett, was born on February the 3rd, 1880. Herman did not see himself working as a clerk forever. Instead, he wanted to study medicine in his autobiography, H. H. Holmes told a story from his childhood when two other boys had dragged him inside a doctor's office and put him face to face with an actual skeleton. Little Herman had been terrified and fascinated at the same time. That moment sparked a lifelong interest in human anatomy. And so, years later, Herman became an apprentice to the same doctor to which office he had been dragged as a boy, Dr. White. After a year studying under him, Herman enrolled in the University of Vermont in Burlington at age 18. But as he was dissatisfied with the school, he dropped out after a year. Then, in 1882, Herman entered the University of Michigan's Department of Medicine and Surgery, from where he graduated in June 1884. Herman was nearly prevented from graduating when a widowed hairdresser accused him of making a false promise of marriage to her. So-called breach of promise was a rather serious crime back then, but it was not until after his graduation that Herman told his professor that the accusations were indeed true. In addition, it had been during his time in school when Herman and his friends first came up with the idea of faking someone's death and using a substitute body to defraud an insurance company. This idea would live and grow in Herman's mind for years to come. After his graduation, Herman was left alone as Clara with their child moved away. According to reports, the marriage had been abusive, but as Clara never received divorce papers, the two technically stayed married until the very end. In 1885, Herman moved to Chicago and adopted the moniker H. H. Holmes. Soon, he began working in a pharmacy owned by Dr. Halton and his wife. Now, a common misconception is that the Haltons were an elderly couple or that Holmes killed them to get the store for himself. Neither is true. The couple were actually still living in the neighborhood when Holmes was eventually arrested. And according to records, at the time he bought the store from them, the Haltons were in their 20s. Nevertheless, soon after, Holmes also purchased an empty lot across from the drugstore at the northwest corner of South Wallace Avenue and West 63rd Street in Englewood. There, he began constructing a building that would become known as the Murder Hotel or Murder Castle. At the time, the building was designed to have two floors, the first was to be for retail spaces and the second for residential apartments, one of which Holmes moved into with his second wife, Myrta Belknap. It would take another five years to add the third floor, which allegedly would serve as a hotel in time for the upcoming World's Fair. However, this would never come to pass. While many descriptions of oddities of the building have been proven wrong, there undoubtedly were some strange features. For example, there was a hidden compartment between the first and second floors, and the stairs between floors could be accessed from a trapdoor located in one bathroom. These were later labeled as secret chamber and secret staircase. Nonetheless, the truth is they were not really secret to anyone, at least to anyone who worked in the building and 
many hidden rooms were most likely used to store stolen furniture and other goods. During this time in his castle, Holmes ran a variety of strange businesses and schemes. It seemed like every week he had a new business plan, but his favorite seemed to be buying goods on credit, selling them and never paying the original bill. Hmm. Another scheme he was fond of involved using people and then killing them. It is impossible to say when Holmes took his first victim. There were rumors of murders happening in his childhood, in college, and during his first years in Chicago. But there is little to nothing to prove any of these allegations. Notwithstanding, the murders that we know happened and can be connected to Holmes usually had a clear motive. Someone knew too much of his schemes or was getting in his way. It appears that H. H. Holmes did not kill simply for the bloodlust. Instead, it seems he did what he felt necessary to continue his lifestyle. The first couple of years with his new wife, Myrta, seemed to have been going nicely. But by the time their daughter was born in 1889, Holmes was having an affair. He had hired a man named Asilius K. Ned Connor to work in his building and with him came his wife, Julia, and their young daughter, Pearl. Ned and Julia soon divorced, with Julia staying in the castle. Holmes had set his eyes on her early on, and it wasn't long before he got what he wanted. Soon, Julia's name began to appear in connection with numerous schemes and frauds in addition to his first wife's and Murta's mother's name. Then one day, Julia and her daughter Pearl disappeared without a trace. Holmes said they had gone to visit family, but nobody ever saw the two again. The next victim was a young secretary called Emmeline Sigrand, with her story being very similar to that of Julia. In 1892, Holmes had offered her double her current salary to work with him, and it wasn't long before their relationship became intimate. However, when autumn arrived, there were signs that Emmeline had changed her mind about Holmes. Nobody can say for sure, as by December, she had also disappeared. A few months later, Holmes began using his charm on another young lady, a wealthy orphan named Minnie Williams. She knew the handsome man with a bushy mustache as Howard Gordon. Soon enough, Minnie was working in the castle as Holmes' personal stenographer, and just a month later, they were presenting themselves as husband and wife, even though they were never actually married. Nevertheless, Minnie was soon part of her husband's schemes, unknowingly, of course. Amongst other things, she signed away several of her real estate holdings to Holmes. She even became the titular owner of a property in Wilmetta, where Holmes was building a house for Murta and Lucy, his real wife and daughter. By July 1893, both Minnie and her younger sister, Anna, had vanished from the face of the earth. Holmes left Chicago half a year later in January 1894 and met his fourth and final wife, Georgiana Yoke, in Denver while using the name Mr. H. M. Howard. Meanwhile, a man named Benjamin Pittersall had moved to St. Louis, Missouri with his family. Benjamin had worked for Holmes for many years and was very well aware of his numerous schemes. He had been Holmes' true partner in crime. So when he was then contacted by Holmes, who had a new plan in mind, Benjamin was immediately in. The pair planned to defraud an insurance company out of $10,000 by taking out a policy on Benjamin, then faking his death. Pittersall was to pose as an inventor who would be killed in an explosion. Holmes would then procure a suitable cadaver that would be burned beyond recognition in the resulting fire. Sounds simple enough, but this time, Holmes was playing his partner. In August 1894, Holmes and Benjamin traveled to Philadelphia, where the plan was to take place. Before leaving, Benjamin had had a talk with his eldest daughter, saying, if you hear about me dead, don't worry about it. After all, he was not supposed to die for real. It is not known for sure why Holmes did what he did. 
Maybe he had become concerned that Benjamin could no longer be trusted or simply couldn't be relied on to convincingly pull off the plot. Nevertheless, when Holmes met his former confederate in Philadelphia, he first made sure Benjamin got extremely drunk before giving him a lethal dose of chloroform and setting his body on fire. Afterwards, Holmes did quite a terrible job trying to stage the death as an accident, but the Pennsylvania coroner bought it anyway, with Fidelity Mutual Insurance agreeing to issue a check for $7,200 to carry Pittazel. Holmes then informed Carrie that Benjamin owed him $5,000, which she quickly paid. Even though Holmes now had his money, there were two problems. First, the Pittazel family knew too much, and secondly, they still thought Benjamin was actually alive and hiding out in London. So he began feeding lies to Carrie with her eventually entrusting three of her five children to Holmes' care. All three were murdered by Holmes, who would later admit that he had locked two of the Pittersle children in a trunk he had drilled a hole in. He then hooked it up to a gas line, asphyxiating the two girls before burying their bodies in the basement of a property he rented in Toronto. Investigators would later find that he had poisoned Howard, the third Pittersle child, before dismembering his body and burning his remains. Holmes would most likely have wiped out the entire family given the chance, but unbeknownst to him, his time was running out. His murder spree finally came to an end when he was arrested on November 17, 1894 in Boston. He was initially charged for horse theft back in Texas. However, charges quickly escalated to insurance fraud, to which Holmes eventually confessed. When investigators then found the corpses of Alice and Nellie and the remains of Howard Pittersall, interest in Holmes and the case exploded. Suddenly, throngs of people knew Holmes and had been working or visiting his murder castle. Everybody wanted to be a part of the story. This led to many sensational headlines about the building and how it was filled with torture rooms, secret passages and quicklime pits. The only problem was that the stories were almost all fiction. In fact, in Chicago, authorities never found enough evidence to charge Holmes for any crime, despite searching the castle through and through. In the end, H. H. Holmes was charged with only one murder, that of Benjamin Pittersall, eventually being convicted and sentenced to death in 1895. While Holmes was waiting for his execution, he confessed to 27 murders. The truth of these confessions is questionable as there are reports that a newspaper had paid Holmes $7,500 to confess and that some of these he claimed to have murdered were still alive. He had been a liar and swindler for much of his life and he didn't change now that the end was in sight. Before his confession, he claimed he was innocent before later stating he had been possessed by the devil. Finally, a little more than a week before his 35th birthday, H. H. Holmes was hanged at Philadelphia's Moyamensing Prison on May the 7th, 1896, his neck failing to break when he dropped through the trapdoor. He was slowly strangled to death over a 20 minute period. In accordance with his last wishes, his coffin was encased in concrete so as to stop grave robbers and buried 10 feet deep. His killing spree was over, but he left behind an endless amount of unanswered questions. Where did Minnie and Anna Williams and Emmeline Sigrand go? Holmes never admitted to murdering them, nor have their bodies ever been found. However, he did say he accidentally killed Julia in a botched abortion before killing her daughter Pearl just to cover up his mess, like he had done to Benjamin Pittersall's children. Unfortunately, we will most likely never know the whole truth about what happened. One can understand the appeal of a tale about a notorious serial killer owning a murder castle with hidden torture chambers and hundreds of victims buried inside its walls. But the truth is, the real story of H. H. Holmes is far less sensational, but no less gruesome. As for what became of the so-called murder castle, well, 
it managed to survive an attempt to burn it to the ground in 1895, before being pulled down in 1938. And in one final twist, the stories and myths around Holmes had grown so strong that over 100 years later, in 2017, his body was exhumed after claims emerged that he had actually managed to escape execution. The belief being that the coffin was empty or that the body within was someone else's. Much like many other stories about him, the truth turned out to be less strange as DNA tests found that the body inside was indeed Holmes. To draw things to a close, we have one of the most harrowing cases we've covered, the tragic story of the Denham Massacre. Denham, it's quiet, it's quaint, and dare I say, it's just a little bit sleepy. This is a quintessential English village. The name itself is derived from the Old English for homestead in a valley. And in 1870, this was home to one 35-year-old Emmanuel Marshall. He lived here with his wife, Charlotte, their four children, and his elderly mother. Their house was a two-story cottage located on Cheapside Lane. Emmanuel was a successful blacksmith, and the cottage also had an offshoot which housed a forge. The family had lived in the house for a long time, more than four decades, and there was no reason why they would not continue to do so. They were well liked in the village, and over the years they had been able to get themselves to the point where they lived quite comfortably. Emmanuel and Charlotte had married in 1860, and by 1870 they had four children together. Mary, aged eight, Thurza, aged six, Gertrude, aged four, and Francis, aged 19 months. Emmanuel's father, William, had died in 1857, leaving his mother, Mary, a widow at the age of 64. After his death, she too moved into her son's cottage. 1870 was the middle of the Victorian era, and despite the many advances for the time, it was still the age of the horse. Now that meant that blacksmiths were still considered as highly valuable members of the community. That and the constant improvement in agricultural equipment meant that Emmanuel was always kept busy, and to that end, he occasionally had to hire extra staff. And that is a detail that we will revisit. In addition, as a blacksmith, he would have made more money than many other workers. For example, back then, a soldier earned 12 shillings a week, farm laborers 14 shillings, while blacksmiths would earn 25 shillings. As far as we know, Emmanuel was a hardworking man who spent a lot of time in the forge attached to the family home. There is not much information available about Charlotte, but the book's advertiser described her as follows. Said by her neighbors to be an excellent housewife, as well as the most respectable woman in all her habits and conduct. A very superior woman. Some intelligent persons described her children as models of neatness and the best behaved in the parish. Emmanuel's mother was also said to be a great person. Mary Marshall, the mother, aged 77, was described as a very worthy and respectable woman to whom her son was exceedingly kind. Then there was Emmanuel's sister, Marianne, who also was a resident with the family at the time. Early 1870 was a happy time for her. She was engaged and her big day was finally coming on Tuesday, May the 24th in Denham Parish Church. Afterwards, Marianne would be moving away to Hertfordshire with her new husband. But for now, while Mary was still staying at the Marshall family home for the wedding, it had been decided that the youngest child, little Francis, would live with relatives to make more room in the cottage. The family was reportedly seen on Saturday, May 21st, by the village policeman and their neighbour, Elizabeth Simpson. They were also seen together at Uxbridge Market, perhaps buying food or other materials for the upcoming event. The following day was Sunday, and Emmanuel's usual routine was to wake up early, 
around 3 or 4 a.m. and work while the rest of his family still slept. Later, they would have all gone together to church, especially as the final reading of Mary Ann's bands were due to take place. However, that Sunday, the Marshall family were nowhere to be seen. Monday, May the 23rd, started like any other Monday in Denham. However, there was one thing that was not quite right. An eerie silence surrounded the normally active Marshall residence. As Lizzie Bampton, the 11-year-old daughter of the innkeeper at the Swan Pub said, I went on Monday evening to Mrs. Marshall's house to take a dress to Mrs. Marshall to make. It was after tea. There was no answer to my knocking. Mrs. Marshall's sister came when I was there. I then left. Charlotte's sister, also named Marianne, reported what she had seen. I saw Charlotte on Friday night. I promised to take tea with her on Monday. I got no answer. Neighbours had not seen anyone. The doors were locked. I saw two men coming along. I asked one of them to get a ladder and he looked in the bedroom window and he saw bedclothes in a heap. He then looked in the back windows on the ground floor. I heard him shout, for God's sake, come here. Soon after, the door was broken down and the gruesome reason why nobody had seen the family since Saturday was revealed. The police were called and PC Charles Trevenant arrived at the scene around 7 p.m. While he had seen a lot as a police officer, nothing could have prepared him for what he was about to find inside the cottage. It was like a battlefield. Blood filled the scene. Charlotte's and Marianne's bodies were lying immediately inside the door. The bodies of the three children were found in the wash house lying together. PC Trevenor also discovered a bloodied sledgehammer and axe. Each of the victims had their night clothes on, except Charlotte, who had a dress partially over her nightdress. They had extensive injuries on their bodies and hands, possibly defensive wounds. There were pools of blood everywhere. As PC Trevenor continued through the property, he went into the forge and discovered Emmanuel lying on his face with his arms stretched out. It appeared like he had been dragged. His body was covered with a sack, an apron and an old coat. A few yards from the body, PC Trevenor found another pool of blood and a poker broken in two. It was thought that this was the weapon used to create the large hole in Emmanuel's forehead. He had been beaten unrecognizable. Before that, it appeared that Emmanuel had struggled with his assailant, resulting in terrible cuts on his hands. In addition, Emmanuel's boots and other items were missing, believed to be stolen by the killer. But who could have felt so much anger towards the Marshall family, who appeared to be very well liked, that they would have butchered every single person present inside the cottage even the children. The horrific slaying of the Marshall family shocked not only the village of just over a thousand people, but the whole country. Needless to say, a story like this quickly spread, and the police had huge pressure to catch whoever did this, and fast. Back then, investigation methods were not as sophisticated as today. Buckinghamshire Constabulary did not even possess any detectives at the time, and so the main responsibility of the Marshall family case was given to Superintendent Thomas Dunham, who had served in the police force for close to 20 years at this point. An early theory was that Emmanuel Marshall had first killed his family and then himself, but this was very quickly ruled out based on the evidence. Another theory was that the Marshall family were killed because of money that they had in the house. However, many found it hard to believe that seven people would be bludgeoned to death in such a brutal way just because of a robbery. We do know that Emmanuel had woken up early that Sunday morning to work. He had his working clothes on and he was found inside the forge. The rest of the family had still been most likely sleeping when the murderer approached the house in the darkness. 
As there were no signs of a struggle inside the forge, it seems that the killer was able to completely surprise Emmanuel, or that he was known to him. Afterwards, Charlotte had either woken to the noise or had been awake already, as she had her dress on. The assailant had then entered the house with a sledgehammer and axe to kill the rest of the family, perhaps to get rid of any possible witnesses. Then, it appears he had changed his clothes as blood-stained items that didn't belong to Emmanuel were found at the scene. While the police did not find any evidence pointing them to a potential suspect straight away, it did not take long for Superintendent Dunham to get on the trail of the killer. A bricklayer called Charles Coombs came forward to say that a man sharing the room with him in an Uxbridge lodging house, calling himself Jack, was seen to be wearing clothes that clearly were not his, and that he had asked Charles to accompany him to pawn a pocket watch. When Charles then heard about the Marshall family massacre, he wondered if anything had been taken from the home. As Charles then mentioned Jack, the clothes and the pocket watch, he was advised to contact the superintendent. This Jack was actually John Jones, also known as John Owens, who at one point in his past had the nickname Jack the Cat Killer, a moniker he garnered due to his tendency to shoot the creatures. Not a good sign at all. John had used a stolen pistol and was sentenced to six weeks in Worcester jail for that crime. Afterwards, his list of offences only grew longer and included both theft offences and violent crimes. Whenever John decided to do honest work, he worked as a blacksmith. And that was his connection to Emmanuel Marshall. You will recall earlier when I said Emmanuel occasionally took on extra labor. One such was a Mr. John Jones. But it turns out his skill set wasn't quite as declared and he made such an awful job of repairing a carriage wheel that in the end, Emmanuel refused to pay him. The police had found their motive. Soon enough, Superintendent Dunham learned from Charles that John had traveled to the Berkshire town of Reading. Having no time to lose, Dunham caught the train to Reading as soon as he could with Charles in tow as he was the only person who knew what the suspect looked like. They arrived here at the building behind me, which at the time was Reading train station and ticket office. 5 p.m. Tuesday, the 24th of May. It didn't take them long to find John Jones. He was in the Oxford Arms public house on Silver Street. On entering, Charles identified him quickly, shouting, that's the man. Dunham leapt towards him as John tried to draw a pistol he had stolen from the marshal's cottage. He was subdued before he could fire it. As he was confronted, he said angrily, I have not murdered man, woman, nor child, but I know who did. I stood by, but never murdered anyone myself. But at this point, nobody had even told John the reason for his arrest. And he was literally standing there still wearing Emmanuel's clothes and boots and having pawn tickets for more missing property in his pockets. Superintendent Dunham knew they had the right man and John was taken back to Slough where he was almost lynched by an angry crowd at the station. It was also revealed that John was only released from prison a few days before the massacre and had been heard speaking of a man in Denham who owed him money, stating if he didn't get it off him, he'd kill him. His trial began on Friday, July 22nd, 1870, and was set to be the trial of the year, if not the decade. Somebody killing seven people at the same time was unheard of. The Crown had a strong case against John, witnesses, and a large number of exhibits to persuade the jury of the defendant's guilt. It turned out that a police officer had also seen John wearing Emmanuel's clothing on the night of the murders. While in today's murder cases, a jury might deliberate for some time, often for a number of days, in Victorian times, things were a little different and it took just two minutes for the jury to come back with a verdict. He was found guilty and sentenced to death by hanging. 
After the judge had passed sentence, the defendant turned to him and replied, Thank you, sir. He later said that his only regret was not shooting the policeman who captured him. Jones was executed on Monday, August the 8th, 1870 at 8 a.m. in Aylesbury Jail. It seems that his only motive to slaughter the Marshall family was simply the idea that Emmanuel owed him money. The only survivor was little Francis Marshall, who had been fortunate enough to stay with relatives at the time of the murders. However, he only lived until the age of 18. His body was laid to rest here, along with his family that he had lost on that fateful day at St. Mary's Church. The church where they would have been attending had John Jones not committed his heinous act. The church where his sister was due to be married. The stone is a little worn and there's a plaque has been placed at the front so that everybody can clearly read the message. This is a memorial to all those who lost their lives in the Denham Massacre. Thank you for watching. It really is appreciated. Right then, take care and I'll see you next time with another story to make you say, well, I never.